Well, would you uh, join me? You can turn to uh, Romans chapter 10. We're going to read verses uh, 5 uh, through 21. Uh, and last week I reminded you, as you're turning there, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that Paul is writing this to a congregation, a mixed congregation, uh, predominantly Gentile, because for five years the Jewish, Jewish people were exiled, uh, political exile, and they returned to a church that's now uh, filled with Gentile converts. And one pastor I was listening to this week talking about this passage uh, pointed out, now when you think of, okay, it's a mixed congregation, but imagine you're one of these religious people from a, from a Hebrew background, and you've come back to, uh, to Rome, and in this church that's now filled with, with Gentiles, you know that these Gentiles weren't just kind of people that went to church a little bit, but they were actually coming uh, out of idol-worshiping backgrounds. There were temples in Rome uh, that were dedicated to worship, but not in the sense we think of worship. They were dedicated to the worship of gods that were strong, strongly sexual in nature. And much of the temple worship during that time was surrounded and driven by this. And so imagine returning to your church. You've been gone for five years, and you're dropping your child off at Sunday school, and the person leading the Sunday school class is one of these Gentiles. Perhaps their background actually led them to have a business that supplied things needed for worship in these temples. You would say, yes, this person now knows Jesus, but I'm not sure I want to drop my children off to be taught in this class. It just gives us a little more perspective on all that's taking place when Paul takes this three-chapter, three not break, but a little of a side to address some of the issues that were particularly the Jewish population. But we said last week, don't think of it Jewish and Gentile. Think of it religious and non-religious. He's addressing those from a religious background like many of us. In our passage this morning, uh, in Romans chapter 10, we're going to see as Paul uh, talks to these Israelites and their concerns, the religious people today, he's going to point us to three things. He's going to point us to how God doesn't save us, he's going to point us to how God does save us, and then he's going to point us to how God sends us. So if you would, would you read with me Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 21. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss, or the deep, your mate, yours may say. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless some, they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ but I ask, have, not, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For the voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous for those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, would you use your word today to remind us of our need again for your grace? And not only our need for grace, but would we look around at everyone around us and see their need for grace? And would that cause us to be people who love our neighbor 
because we love you, and we love you because you have first loved us. And when we see how you have redeemed us, and part of what you do when you redeem us in sending us out, we ask, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, firstly, how God doesn't save us. How God doesn't save us. Well, Paul begins by addressing the religious person, trusting in the law when he writes, verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Later, we know that Paul writes, or in another place in Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul writes and he, he says this, Cursed, or for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. Now, when we think of the law, our mind generally leaps to the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy. But the law is much greater than just the Ten Commandments. It's actually the first five books of the law. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteron uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus. Yeah, there we go. Make sure I get it right. It's all these things. So it's more than just these ten commandments that are there. And you realize these first five books of the law have a great deal of breadth in terms of what they cover in law. There's religious law. There's marital law. There's agricultural law. There's business law, there's po uh, political law, there's parental law, there's dietary law, there's estate law, there's hygienic law. And that is just part of what's covered. There's so much more there. And Paul is saying, one way you can be saved is if you can keep every one of these things perfectly. But of course we know that Paul has told us earlier in Romans, that's not possible. But he's also told us the problem isn't with the law. The problem is with us. We are the problem. We can't do it. So the law doesn't save us. Well, what does? So what does save us? Well, how does God save us? Verses 8 through 13 talk about this. Paul makes it clear in verses 8 through 13 uh, that people can be saved. That's the good news. People can be saved. God is at work. But he helps us to see as we think about all of Romans... But what do we need to be saved from? I was watching a video this week, a friend of mine had posted, and it was all about Christian jargon that people use. And yet so many people, they may come into the church having never been around it, and they have no idea what it means. So when we say we must be saved, what does that mean? Well, Paul is writing to explain to us what, from what we are saved and how we can be saved. He reminds us that our first and our greatest problem from which we need to be saved is sin. Sin are those twisted uh, heart desires that show deep down what we think. They show what we love, and they show in themselves and how we live. So we need to be saved from our sin, and we also need to be saved from ourselves because we live lives that are alienated from God, wanting our own way. And remember, Matt reminded us a couple weeks ago, we touched on it last week, the heart that is alienated from God doesn't stay neutral. It always gets farther from the Lord and it hardens. Unless, unless God intervenes and calls someone to himself. Look at what Paul writes. He says, but if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So what does it mean to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord? Well, uh, confessing that someone was Lord would have been very common uh, for the people in Rome to understand. Because you see, during this time, uh, the different political leaders, the Caesars, would print uh, and have printed these coins, right? They would have them minted, coins uh, that were there, and they were really intended to be called tribute coins. They would pay taxes with these coins, and on each of these coins uh, was stamped a message that reminded them uh, that Caesar was actually a... a, a from a divine origin, the divinity of Caesar. And people would say, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. So when naturally the Christians come along and begin to say, Jesus is Lord, you see where part of the problem comes in. Now imagine being brought in before Caesar and him expecting you to say, Caesar is Lord. Right? You can ask him, well, okay, what is he wanting to hear? Is he wanting to hear a, a mumbled, half-hearted, Caesar's Lord, I guess. No. 
Caesar wants you to declare with certainty and with passion that Caesar is Lord. Why? Why such a bold declaration? Because you see, in making that statement, what Caesar is wanting you to understand and what he's wanting you to communicate is this. Caesar, you're not only Lord over Rome. You are Lord over me. And it's declaring, if you will, a sense of allegiance. So is it any surprise that the Apostle Paul reminds us that in order to be saved, we must confess that Jesus is Lord. You see, it's much more than just some knowledge or intellectual assent given to who Jesus is and what he's done, or historical fact, but it's an admission of the Lordship of Christ and our submission to him as King and Lord. Paul goes on and says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you see, it's much more than just those words, but there's a, a, a heartfelt belief component that comes in of, of re- actual trusting in the words which you're saying. Confess with your mouths and believe in your hearts are two sides of the same coin. It's not two separate things. They are two sides that mean and communicate the same idea. In his commentary, John Stott points out the importance of both uh, confession and belief. And he says, confession without faith, he uses faith for belief, confession without faith would be vain. And likewise, faith without confession would be found to be spurious or fake or counterfeit. Both confession and belief or faith are necessary. And what does Paul say they must believe? You must believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Why does Paul key in on this idea that they must believe in the importance of Jesus' resurrection? Well, you see, there are many people in our world who would give an intellectual assent that Jesus was a great person, he was a great moral teacher, he did some really good things. But you see, to acknowledge that Jesus rose from the dead, that has implications. I can no longer just think of Jesus as a really good teacher or a pretty good person. His resurrection calls me to make a decision on my allegiance. I'm either going to reject him as king or I'm going to bow the knee and say Jesus is Lord. To say that Jesus is Lord indicates our allegiance to Christ. But I also think think, uh, in reading this week it was helpful to see that the Apostle Paul points to the resurrection of Christ from the dead in the sense of hope. Not just the legion, but I think he points, it, points us to our ultimate hope. It's important if, if Jesus is Lord, understanding his resurrection is connected to our ultimate resurrection. And it calls us, when we trust in Jesus, say Jesus is Lord, and we believe that God raised him from the dead, Paul's already written us several times about our ultimate resurrection. He begins to tell us that as we come to Jesus and admit that he's Lord, and we believe that God raised him from the dead, it is that ultimate resurrection around which we begin to reorient our entire life under the lordship of Jesus. Paul is trying to help us see that the good news of salvation by faith is comprehensive, but it's not complicated. It's not complicated. I I didn't talk much, say anything about these verses. I'm just going to touch briefly. There's earlier in the passage where he says, you know, don't say, well, do we need to go up to the heavens? That's to bring Christ down. Or to go down to the deep, that's to bring Christ up. And then he says, well, what do you know? He says, well, the word is in your mouth. It's in your heart. He's trying to tell us that Jesus is close. He's here. You don't have to go looking far and wide for him. There's nothing you need to do. Jesus has done everything necessary for you. Christ is available. He's so available that he says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we see him use that word in this passage, everyone, several places. Well, what great news. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That kind of news should, cause, should move us. It's what he was hoping it would do in the, in the Israelites that were in the church or the Hebrews who had come to faith in Jesus. As they looked at their fellow Israelites, they began to ask, why aren't they trusting in Jesus? Paul wants that idea that anyone who calls in the name of the Lord can be saved to light something within them. 
So I was thinking about it this week, trying to think of a way to illustrate it, and I, this is the best I could come up with. If I were to stand up here this morning, and everybody was, let's say our congregation was full, and the sanctuary was, and I, and I said, I have found, somebody gave me a phone number this week, and just by calling this phone number, whoever calls, they can actually get a free, all-expense-paid, all-inclusive trip to an exclusive uh, island paradise. I know it sounds too good to be true. There's no timeshare tour you have to do. You just call the number, and they give you the free wake, a week of vacation in this beautiful place. All you have to do is call. Well, my guess is that some of you would be saying, what is that number? But I also know not every one of you would. Some of you would say, well, I hate the beach. Some of you would say, I I'm too afraid to fly. Some of you would say, that deal's too good to be true. Some of you would say, Steve, we just don't trust you. All could be, uh, could be worthy responses. But some of you would say, can I get that number so that I can call? And Paul is saying here, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And naturally, he's hoping we would ask, well, how can that happen? How can we see people call on the name of the Lord? And Paul answers this by asking four questions. There are four questions that Paul's going to ask uh, to help us understand what takes place. And he does this, really, as I think about the passage on answering the question, how does God send? How does he not save us? It's not by the law. How does he save us? It's by repenting and believing and confessing and admitting Jesus is Lord. And look what he does. He answers these four questions in verse 13, uh, 13 to 15, I think. Uh, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. In these questions Paul asks, he's asking, well, how, how are they going to call on, if that's what they have to do, how are they going to call on someone whom they've never believed? And, and, and how are they going to believe if they've never heard and how have they heard if someone hasn't preached to them? And how is someone going to preach unless they are sent? You see, these verses remind us again that if people are called in the name of the Lord, God has to do something. God has to do something to be at work. But these same verses also remind us, just as God has to do something, so do we. So do we. For anyone to call on the Lord to confess with their mouth, to believe in their hearts, they must hear from someone. Paul uses the word preach. Now, we sometimes we might think about this preach and think of people like me who stand behind a pulpit and do this. That's not the idea that Paul is, pre is talking about necessarily. The idea is more of a herald, right? A herald, one who would bring news, usually as a representative of a king or a military official. They didn't carry their own message, they have been given a message by one who was over them and entrusted with that message and told to go and to proclaim it. It could be one who is bringing good news to the kingdom of a defeat of an army and coming back and telling, but the herald is one tasked with carrying the message. The passage we read in our New Testament reading this morning in 2 Corinthians 5 is a similar idea, but it uses a different word. When he uses the word, we are Christ's ambassadors, we are Christ's ambassadors and that God has committed to us, his people, the ministry of reconciliation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. And we're ambassadors. And he says, as though God were making his appeal through us. We are those sent to preach. And to preach and proclaim the good news of the gospel so that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord may be saved. And it's important for us to remember what the good news of the gospel is. And it's really important. It, should seem, it may seem very basic as I talk about these things, but you need to listen to the voices around us, often coming out of church, of what the good news is if you want to be a Christian. Because the good news isn't go to church. The good news isn't just be a better person. The good news isn't just try to sin, not so much. And the good news isn't vote, insert favorite political party here. 
Because you see, there are people in the city of Austin who would say, just go to church and try to be a better person, and that's what you need. And I'm going to tell you, friends, that is not good news. That's bad news. Because you know what? The law, that's what the law is. We can't do it. But we need to understand and remind us that Paul tells us part of what the message is. He says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That the word and the message, <coughs> excuse me, of Christ are what's important. The message of the gospel is that Jesus, the very Son of God, died for our sins, rose from the dead, proving he had power over death and sin and hell. And by simple faith, you can trust in him and experience the forgiveness of your sin, the removal of shame that Paul mentions here. And you're given a new life. Repent. Just trust in Jesus. As simple as calling on the name of the Lord seems, Paul gives us a warning. And he asks that, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. They haven't all called on the name of the Lord. Well, Paul follows this warning by addressing some very important questions. And you see, with such wonderful news that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, with that wonderful news, the question we should have is not the first earlier was, well, how do we get him to call? But here's the question, why don't they call? Why don't they call? And Paul answers by giving us three illustrations. He's going to point us to something uh, that we hear, something that we feel, and something that we see using all of our senses. He says in verse 18, but I ask, uh, have they not heard? Here's what, we, here's what we hear. We hear a voice. He says, indeed they have heard. Indeed, they have heard and hear this voice. We talked about a couple weeks ago. If you're in your Bible, if you ever see an adjustment to the, uh, the margins or it may be in italics, it's telling you it's quoting another passage. Here at Psalm 19, he says, Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Psalm 19 is a beautiful description of the heavens declaring the glory of God. And by looking around, we see there's someone at work. That God is there declaring, and the heavens are declaring his glory. And while it isn't an audible voice, it's as if he's saying, look, all of the world is screaming out. God is here. He has worked. Someone made all of this, and he is great. So Paul says, if, have they not heard? No, they've heard by looking around. Second thing, he gives us this something that they feel, and he begins to talk to the, the Israelites who are in the congregation. He says, I know part of your problem. He says, uh, in verse 19, he says, but I asked, did Israel not understand? It's not did they hear, not hear. Here it's did they not understand, and Paul says, no, they understood, but they didn't like it. He tells them that God has worked in the salvation of the Gentiles, those non-religious people, to make these religious people envious. It's not an envy to hurt them, but it's actually a, a sense of envy that's designed to make them hungry and to wake them up. He's drawing from Deuteronomy 32 and Isaiah 65 and saying, when you look at these Gentiles, these non-religious people who've come to faith in Jesus, you look down upon them. You look down upon them in judgment, but you've, because you've forgotten, it's all of grace. And I have showered my grace upon them, even when they didn't deserve it, and precisely because they didn't deserve it. And, I, and Israelites, I want you to look at them, and I want you to want what they have. One of my favorite pastors refers to this as saying, we all need a little bit of holy envy. A little bit of holy envy. I'll tell you where you can see it. Go to an economically depressed area of the world, in particular outside of our country in a lot of ways, and get around some Christians. There's two things that will happen. I've had seen this happen uh, in Peru, in Mexico, and in China. Be around economically depressed people in other parts of the world who are Christians, and you'll be, two things will happen. You'll become convicted. First, you'll become convicted by your abundance. The abundance of your stuff. And secondly, not far after that, you will become convicted of your lack, your lack of joy. Joy totally apart from stuff, because Jesus is all they have, and he's come to realize that Jesus is all they need. They have joy. 
I've been so reminded about this just the last few weeks as one of our members, Joanne Rawson, is, and her daughter Abby, as they've undergone difficulty with trying to find Abby a place to live, and then both in the, having uh, COVID-19 and having to deal with all of those things. And as she would send updates, the, the end of the email always said something, thank God for his answered prayer. Thank God for his goodness to us. And I'm going to tell you, there's times where I look at her circle and I go, I'm not sure I'd say that. But I want that to be true of me. A little bit of that holy envy. So there's something we hear, something a voice from the Lord, something we feel, that envy. But lastly, he said there's something he wants us to see. He talks about it in verse 21. He's quoting Isaiah 65, verse 2. And he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. It's a picture of God's prophets, in particular Isaiah, calling the people to repent and to trust in the Lord. But we know that the human heart, left to itself, apart from God's sovereign mercy, only becomes harder and harder and more distant. This passage reminds us that God is merciful. The one he chooses and calls, he's the one who chooses and calls, but man, man is also responsible for something. Man must believe. But I said a second ago that there's something else that we must do, even though uh, God does something, so must we. Well, this passage for me is a reminder that as one who is trusted in, in Jesus, there's something else I must do. Just as God has predestined those whom he's going to call to be his own, he's also predestined the means by which people are going to hear the gospel. And that means is us. I'm going to close by sharing a story that many of you all probably saw on your Facebook feed as mine was filled with the last couple days. Of the story from, uh, of a man named Minkayi. He was a, a tribal leader in a group of uh, the Warani tribe uh, in uh, uh, the jungles of Ecuador where five missionary families moved uh, down there to reach, to reach this unreached group of Indians who had no gospel presence, and they set out to go, and they worked to develop a relationship, and one day these five men landed on the beach, and rather than being greeted with a warm reception and open arms, these five men were speared to death. Five families now left without fathers. And in 1956, this group of American missionaries moved there in hopes of taking the gospel to this tribe that had been unreached. Many of you know the story of Minkai, along with those five, five other friends. So six Indians killed these five men. Minkai himself killed two of the men, I think Ed McCauley and Nate Saint, spearing them to death when their plane landed. Several of these Indian men who actually killed these missionaries came to faith in Jesus. You see, the families that moved to Ecuador, when their husbands died, they didn't leave. The wives stayed with their children that were there and continued to minister and seek to take the gospel to these Indians. And God's work carried on. Well, just last week, I think on the 28th of April, Minkai went to be with Jesus, about 90 or so years old. And after coming to faith in Jesus, he often traveled to to India and here in this country and different parts of the world sharing his story. Some of you have seen The End of the Spear. Some of you have read uh, uh, Elizabeth Elliot's books, Through Gates of Splendor, Passion and Purity, all wonderful books. But Minkai would travel around sharing his story, the story of how Jesus had saved him, the one who had murdered these missionaries. And his most frequent theme was this, as he was speaking to those in churches in different places, he would ask them this. He said, we lived angry. We lived hating and killing. And when you would ask him why, he would say, yanga, meaning for nothing. We just did. Until the missionaries, he says, brought God's markings. And when he says God's markings, he's referring to God's word, of a path of how to live. Because Minkai would say that when we would go with our, our dads hunting, we would leave a trail So that if we got separated, we could find the trail, the markings, and find our way back home. He said, we lived angry until the missionaries brought us God's markings. He said, now those of us who walk God's trail live happy and in peace. Then he would often ask, how long did you have God's markings before you brought them to us? He says, well, I don't know. Maybe if we'd had them sooner, maybe if we had had sooner, that the creator God 
did not see it well that we should did not see it well that we would live angry, hating and killing for no reason. We could have walked God's trail sooner. Friends, we uh, live in a time where people need the gospel. And God in his mercy has sent Jesus, his son. And he is at work even now in the hearts of people around us all the time. And would you join me in praying that we will become people who see their need, but who also see as those who have been redeemed, we've been called to preach the gospel to those that are around us so that they can hear and believe and call upon the Lord and be saved. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I confess that in my heart I'm often so too much afraid. Afraid I won't say everything right when I know that people need you. At the same time, there are places where I'm not afraid, but I just don't look at people the way you do. I don't see them as lost. They seem like they have it pretty well together. They have great families, great jobs. They don't seem to have any problems. Yet Jesus, uh, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5, we don't look at the outward appearance anymore. We want to look at the heart and see their need. The same need that we had when you called us to yourself. When you used other people, often friends or family members, to share Jesus with us. And Jesus, would you call us as a church, not just Cross Point Church, but the churches in Austin, to be churches that embrace you and your gospel. And would that do its work of helping us to see the needs of those around us so that they might call on Jesus. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. And would you receive the Lord's benediction? Actually, a reminder, next Sunday we will meet. Uh, please watch the, uh, the video that's on the website for more details, but please check that out. Receive this good word from the Lord. Beloved in Christ, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Go in his peace.